Hello everybody and welcome to another Detail Diatribe where today Red and I are back to uh, to retread some ground. <laughs> yeah baby, because it turns out one of the most iconic superheroes ever written and the most popular one in the world has more than one video's worth of stuff to talk about with him. Yeah, we, we, uh, so we've we done a video on this before um, and then we were chatting about it uh, like a few weeks afterwards and we were like, do we have... Do we have more thoughts on this? Do we have another detailed diatribe's worth? So um, it started off as a joke, like <laughs> Superman detailed diatribe number two, and then we were like, "Wait, hold on." But wait, <laughs> but what if? So uh, wait, we're going to be more. we're going to be talking about some more Superman stuff. If you haven't seen the first one, we're going to do a brief recap. Uh, hmm. It is is a companion piece, but it stands on its own. So if you just want to jump into this one, that's great. That's great. Yeah. This is like the other half of the conversation. That first one was all me talking, and then this one is Blue getting to actually talk too. <laughs> <laughs> when last we left uh, our brave hero, we discussed uh, the origins of the character from the 1930s onward, unpacked a little bit of why we find him so compelling with three key stories for the man who has everything, uh, which is basically Superman getting a vision of, you know, his, his perfect life, his perfect family. So we had a sight of what Superman truly wants, which is a very insightful thing, part of his character. Yeah, we get a uh, story of Superman versus the elite, which is what happens when Superman is put into conflict with a gang of superheroes that kill and how he deals with that. Uh <laughs> it, it highlights his principles and uh, essentially it lets him respond to the 90s antihero craze that was itself a response to him. Yeah. Uh, and, and finally, we got whatever happened to the Man of Tomorrow, which is a mm. interesting examination of uh, what the world is like after Superman died? Question mark? I'm sorry, I just <laughs> read ahead on the slide. <laughs> 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 oh, boy. <laughs> anyway, yeah, uh, it was. it's essentially a, an Alan Moore what-if Elseworld, I believe is what they're typically called, mm. uh, story wherein Superman uh, faces a greater threat than he's ever faced before, solves the problem, but in the process causes the villain to die and essentially concludes he can no longer be Superman and uses gold kryptonite to permanently remove his own powers. Uh, yeah. At the end, it's revealed that he does not immediately die, as Lois implies, but actually he just married Lois. They have a little kid with superpowers. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's essentially Alan Moore writing the only circumstances under which Superman could ever retire. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we, we pivoted to an explanation of Superman as a subversion and then further subversions on Superman. Again, kind of pointing back to the Superman versus the elite thing, looking mm -hmm. at the concept of, of satire in regards to Superman and caused a little bit of a stir uh, in discussing a, a show. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later, that's okay. Uh, we are yeah, awaiting trial yeah. at The Hague for uh, <laughs> for talking crap about a show that um, is not for us. We'll, we'll get to that later. We'll talk about a very good example uh, from that show. Uh, and we finally got on a soapbox about why caring is good, actually, because it's easy to get kind of like, oh, I'm gruff, I don't give a shit. It's like, no, <laughs> no, it's Superman shows what he, the best of humanity can be. And that's that's a cool thing to celebrate. We're not we're not too cool for caring. I think a lot of the reason people have difficulty writing Superman now is because it is unfashionable to write stories where caring uncritically uh, and uh, with with a lot of heart and uh, sincerity is out of fashion uh, and allowing a superhero to just be genuinely good, heroic, trying his best and not doing the bad things he is tempted potentially to do is an unfashionable choice. The reason why writers are struggling is not because it is impossible to write a Superman story that is relevant to the modern day, it's because it's impossible to write a good Superman story without writing him as Superman. You see the issue. So, with all that said from, from the last video, what, what could possibly be, be left to discuss? <laughs> the answer is plenty. Uh, <laughs> there's a whole Loads, lot left that we baby. can talk about. Essentially, one aspect that we didn't really touch on last time is how Superman works in the mechanics of the story and what makes a great Superman story versus what makes a boring Superman story because we kind of talked about mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, some people think that Superman's boring, but he's not. And we talked about in his character what is interesting about, you know, a, a paragon of virtue, but mechanically in the story in terms of setting up stakes and conflict and actually creating drama, yeah. what are people missing about Superman that, that maybe is, is stopping some stories from being the best they could be? So the question is, how can a Superman story have stakes when the character has such a ridiculously OP power set that makes fighting 
completely bland. In a punch fest, mm-hmm. it's just, okay, Superman throws a punch at a guy who's indestructible and doesn't bleed, the guy punches Superman who's indestructible and doesn't bleed. It's like, it's a less well-choreographed Dragon Ball Z fight. What you get after that is, aha, but you see the, the, the supervillain has, has kryptonite, like everybody else on Metropolis, apparently. <laughs> it's like, yeah, everybody gets their standard issue kryptonite when they go to villain school, and it's like, okay, yeah. cool, so yeah. either the fight is not interesting because nothing happens because these two people can't hurt each other, or the supervillain pulls out the one rock that can hurt Superman, and then the only way Superman ever gets hurt is because this one dumb rock. It's yeah. it's boring. Uh, he is at once too fragile and too strong, and that's bad. Yeah, yeah. Superman is basically a Boolean variable. He's either far too strong for the situation at hand or far too weak. He doesn't yeah. have any specialty skills. He doesn't even have any combat training, so his fight no. choreography is basically flying at the thing and then slinging a right hook at it. Yep. So... Essentially, when he has on occasion fought other Kryptonians who've had actual combat training, he gets severely outclassed. When he fights anybody as strong as he is, he tends to lose because he just, he can't really train. It's kind of impossible for him. Which means that constructing stakes for a Superman scene is difficult. Normally you do this by giving conflict to the scene, but how do you provide conflict for somebody who can either fix the problem or he cannot fix the problem? Fantastic segue, Red. The answer is that you derive stakes <laughs> from saving people. Because yeah. Superman is not squishy, but humans are. Very. So, you know, if the question is, can Superman punch the guy, the answer is always yes. But if the question is, can Superman save everyone before something bad happens, that's trickier. That's not obvious. And mm-hmm. you get problems that you can't just punch your way out of and doesn't involve more dumbass kryptonite. <laughs> so when <laughs> when Superman's power set boxes him in by making him less interesting for fights, it opens up a fantastic array of options for choreographing rescue sequences. So you get mm-hmm. crashing airplanes, falling buildings, natural disasters, all the kinds of things that Superman can't punch his way out of, but he can use his flight, his strength, his speed, heat vision, cold breath, and his indestructibility in interesting ways to save people from danger. So he becomes kind of a Swiss army knife of cool things that he can do to save people from so many situations that other superheroes can't even compete with. Like, you know, Batman is a genius. If a building's collapsing, Batman can't do anything. Yeah, <laughs> Superman yeah. can. The, the, the set pieces that you can use and the interesting scenarios of Rube Goldberg death traps that you can put people <laughs> in can be much more interesting and complex and well choreographed with someone with Superman's power set. And and so, as an example, from the uh, 1942 Max Fleischer Superman cartoon that you're seeing a still from on screen, here he is saving people from a volcano. You can't punch a volcano. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting, and it works well, even in the span of like a, a six, seven-minute cartoon, because you have this situation that requires lateral thinking and balancing how do I solve the problem with how do I stop people from getting hurt before I solve this problem. So it ends up Mm -hmm. working really, really well. And not just that, it also has a degree of variable success that regular combat doesn't. Either you beat the supervillain or you don't. That's, again, it's a Boolean variable. But in this case, it's like, okay, there's a volcano erupting. Can you stop it from erupting and thus save everybody? Or if not, can you evacuate in time? Or if not, can you like wall off the lava? You know, there are, and that's just the volcano example. There are a lot of environmental threats that Superman can essentially fight on genuinely even footing. And it's not as simple as, oh, he's gonna win because he's the hero and they're the bad guy. It's like, you gotta save a lot of people from a lot of different threats. How smart are you? How fast are you? How well can you do this complex mm. skill challenge, essentially? And we, we've talked on, on many, or I guess you've talked on many a trope talk about <laughs> how, you know, killing your, your protagonists is, is, is a high bar. That's, that's, a, that's a heavy threat. So mm. you really can't pull it all that much in media. So if Superman's fighting a guy and it looks like he's maybe on the ropes, it's like, okay, I mean, he's... It's probably going to be fine. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they might capture him or stick a rock in his face or something, but he'll be okay. Ah, pocket sand, except it's pocket kryptonite. Maybe this is going to be the Jimmy Olsen episode where he gets to rescue Superman for a change. I don't know. Yeah, yeah but, but when you have situations like this, you do have a, a, a variable fail state of there are a lot of ways this can go right and a lot of ways this can go bad, and those aren't mutually exclusive. So in a fist fight, either he wins or he doesn't. But in this, all kinds of stuff can happen, and that 
that makes it you know much more more tense for the audience which is which is good for drama and more interesting to watch which is crucial much more interesting to watch things like this also allow superman to showcase his resourcefulness because you know we think of batman as the world's greatest detective superman is an incredibly smart reporter he's a smart guy but so many mm. stories use him as a blunt instrument because they don't really let him do all that much because he's just punching but if you get to see him as a reporter if you get to see him thinking creatively about how to solve dangerous situations and get people out of peril that becomes much more interesting because it's satisfying to watch characters actually be smart. And that is part of what makes him the quintessential superhero because he can save everyone from things that no one else can. Again, kind of back to that, that Batman example of Batman can't mm -hmm. stop a, a collapsing building. Superman can. It, it seems obvious. It seems like this is such an obvious core of his character. But I've personally noticed that a lot of superhero media has been sort of shifting away from ever showing the heroes just saving regular innocent people, people who aren't main characters, people who aren't mm -hmm. named love interests or whatever. There's just been a a loss of focus because ultimately, you know, again, mechanically speaking, those people do not matter so much. Individually, they're background characters. That's how it works. They're NPCs. From the mechanics of the story perspective, they are, oh, it's a busload of innocents. Oh, it's a building with people in it, I assume. And there's a reason, I think, why writers sort of forget it. You know, they streamline it. Oh, we don't need this. We don't need that. It's, you know, oh, of course he's going to save a bunch of innocent people. So it's easy to forget that it's genuinely one of the most foundational elements of all superheroes. Yeah. Why do we have superheroes? So they can save people yep. from threats that people cannot save themselves from. Why do we have Superman? Because he can do things and protect people from things that nobody else can handle, not even the other superheroes. Everyone else has, oh, they're flammable, or they're not bulletproof, or, you know, whatever. Superman's just like, no, no, I just, the only problem with Superman is he can't be everywhere at once. Yeah. That's basically his only issue. And the fact is, it, it really does hit. Even if, oh, we don't know these people, we don't recognize these people, it matters that we don't know those people. It matters that they're just random innocents. Exactly. Because Superman saves everybody. That's yeah. the whole point. And, and one thing that I, I noticed in, in thinking back to some old, uh, you know, Marvel movies and stuff is that it is usually the case that all superheroes get some moment in the beginning of their stories, you know, assuming everything's an origin story, of like where they actually do save people. Yeah. But then the villain shows up and that becomes the real conflict where once this bad guy arrives, it's like, okay, you know, I, I did my little friendly neighborhood spider maning but now there's, you know, like Vulture or whoever the hell is, is in town. And now that's the real problem where yeah saving people is the kitty stuff that you do before graduating to fighting supervillains exactly superman proves that you never need to graduate to fighting supervillains you can still have a compelling character whose main thing is saving people that that's not like the first step in being a big you know puncher of the evildoers yeah that's the whole thing <laughs> yeah you're right it is almost framed like you graduate from solving street level crime up to fighting costumed weirdos and then you never save innocent people again yeah and anyone who gets stuck in a death trap is like your girlfriend or something like that yep. that that seems to I, I will say that one of the reasons I think some of the um, Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies have held up as well as they did is they keep coming back to Spider-Man saving innocence. Yeah, you know, he, exactly. he, the climax of the first movie, it's literally choose now Mary choose. Jane or this truckload of innocent people. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, and then in the second one where he's lost his powers, he saves people from a burning building without his powers and struggles so much with it. And it's one of the only times where he's like, maybe having powers was actually <laughs> good and important and necessary. Yeah. Because he has this sobering moment where he, he does all this work to get this little girl out and then he hears the firefighter be like, somebody died on the top floor, nobody could get to him. And yeah. it's just like, oh God. Yeah. But then again, the MCU, like, I think we get a little bit in the in the first Iron Man where he sort of nebulously saves some innocent people who are being threatened by terrorists. But mostly it's about, look at all the cool missiles he can shoot out of his cool suit. Yeah. And Captain America, oh, he's nebulously fighting Hydra, the Nazis. He's nebulously saving people. But all the people we really see him saving are his buds, you know, Bucky yeah. and co. And then Thor, he saves that town. But even then it's like, everyone get out of the way so I can fight the supervillain, you know? Everyone mm -hmm. get out of the camp so I can fight the Red Skull. Everyone get out of this area so so I can blow stuff up indiscriminately with my walking nuclear missile silo, et cetera, et cetera. And because of that, the MCU has almost no focus on saving innocent people. And the more fantastical and large scale the conflicts got, the more sort of distant the concept of saving people became. It's like, oh, we're, we undo the snap and we fit, we save everybody, but you don't see a single one until like later tie-in shows. When you pointed this out, I had this moment of like everything shifted <laughs> because I've been thinking about superheroes a lot and somehow this one, the crux of the issue, why do we have superheroes to save people, 
yeah, but what do we focus on? Oh, the cool fights, the powers, the, the in a fight who would win stuff. But no, why do we have them? So they can save people, so they can yeah. save everybody. And when you pointed out Superman is genuinely at his most interesting when we see him saving people, I was like, yes, that's what everything has been missing. And it highlights a fundamental problem in, in the overall writing that people forget what the point of superheroes is. It's yeah. just mashing action figures together because that's the flashy bit, but without the foundations, the flash has nothing to hold it up. Yeah, Red, you want me to make you really mad right now? Uh-oh, sure. Remember the, uh, the you remember in uh, in the first Avengers movie where they're like fighting in New York and there was that, that scene of like the waitress who Steve ran into earlier in the movie and what she uh -huh. is doing? Played by Crit Critic Role's Ashley Johnson, I believe. Remember how they, they, they cut all those scenes? Yeah, yeah. Those are deleted scenes? scenes uh -huh. we don't actually get that in the movie yeah <laughs> whereas having eyes on the ground of what is actually happening to the innocent people of new york city while everything's going down would have been incredibly important and helpful it would have buoyed up the entire scene and and made it feel more meaningful than just look at it oh he shot his beam at the shield and then it reflected the beam Phew, multi-kill and as the movies progressed, again, like you said, it's like, oh, you graduate from street-level crime to the good stuff. Now we have a reason to introduce supervillains. The supervillains always arise in response to the superheroes. They're never there first, yep. you know? That's mm -hmm. something. <laughs> but essentially, it's like the writer's like, all right, we got it out of the way. You, you've, you've logged your five hours of community service, and now we can introduce your costumed nemesis. That's fantastic. You never need to worry about all that tedious stuff again. And it's like... Yeah, on, on some level, writing, you know, you can genuinely plant something and then be like, all right, I've established that, I can leave it alone, I don't need to keep hammering the point home. I've shown that this person puts out fires, you know, I've shown that they help, you know, innocent people. That's good, now I can get to the good stuff. The point that you made that really sort of shifted everything was, this is, in Superman's case, the good stuff. Yeah. With Batman, it's fun to watch him fight. It's fun to watch him scare the crap out of villains that are ten times more powerful than him because he just doesn't give up. It's fun to watch him solve crimes. But with Superman, it is fun. It is most fun to watch him face a challenge we know he cannot just punch into submission. Yep. And one of those reasons is, like I said, with there's, there's variable levels of success. This is one of the only ways to hurt Superman in a real meaningful way. Yes. Is if he, if he can't save everyone or if he worries that he can't save everyone. And that, again, that's good for drama. It's good for pathos. Wow, I'm really just psychically reading your, your slides in advance. Hey, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to structure this. Uh, you are exactly Hello. right, Red. Uh, it is a great source of character drama, and a lot of stories have tried to inject edge into Superman's persona through various means. We'll get to the Snyderverse stuff later. But one of the most <laughs> genuine ways to do it is that Clark feels immense grief and guilt in the instances where he's not able to save everybody. That's great for brooding, great for angst, love to see that drama, but <laughs> it's in completely brooding. keeping with his character. In an episode of Smallville, uh, early on mm -hmm. in the show, like episode 13, he fails to save his friend Chloe and she gets hurt. She lives, but he feels really bad about it. It's a wake-up yep. call for him, and what he does is he talks to his mom and he talks to his dad, and they basically give him the advice of, you can't save everyone, but you can always try and try to think ahead and try to stop other people from getting hurt. So you don't just feel sorry about yourself. What are you going to do about that? Fantastic mm -hmm. bit of writing in this episode. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the really good things about the early seasons of Smallville is the whole thing was geared around showing how this kid grows up to be Superman. Like, there's various episodes that are dedicated to him getting some of his iconic powers in various contexts, but also some of it is about him learning important life lessons. One of the biggest mysteries of the show is, hey, Lex Luthor is Clark Kent's best bud in Smallville right now. How's that gonna go wrong? <laughs> like, what's gonna happen with that? And this episode I thought was very important for you, for you constructing the slideshow because as I was sort of just watching through it, I noticed, oh, there's gonna be a, there's a life lesson in this episode. You can kind of <laughs> hear it in the dialogue. And as soon as Chloe gets hurt and Clark's like, I just, I should have been, I should have been able to save her. I was like, there it is. There's our big blue boy <laughs> scout. <laughs> Yeah, hey. exactly. Yeah. And this is partially why Lois Lane is such an effective character to have in the shows, the movies, or whatever. Because even though she is an excellent character in her own right, which some people forget, and a great <laughs> teammate for Clark Kent as a reporter and for, for Superman, they have their own interesting dynamics in that weird love triangle. Um, she's mechanically useful in the story as a go-to proxy for innocent people. She's a face that we know, an established character that we will automatically root for 
to be saved in a way mm-hmm. that, you know, jumping back a few slides, like the firefighter and the, and the kid are like, yes, they're innocents. I, I, I would like to see them saved. Thank you. But with Lois, it's great because we already are primed to care about her so much. She's a really excellent proxy for nebulous, innocent people who we might not know and, and have any prior connection to beyond just a human who needs saving. Yeah, it, it does, of course, need to be balanced because some writers take this to mean if we just show Superman saving Lois over and over again, everything will be fine. But that can just make it seem like Superman doesn't care about anyone but Lois on account of her being his love interest, et cetera, et cetera. But Lois, when she is working as a proxy, like you point out on this slide, there's a bit where she's just on a plane and the plane gets hijacked by goons. And they're like, oh, no, Lois Lane, the one Superman always saves. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <like> <laughs> Uh, I, I love a good genre savvy henchman. Yeah, he's like, oh god, we're so screwed, and the Superman shows up like two seconds later. Yeah, match, of course, yeah. And <laughs> this is right. You're exactly right. Once again, you read my mind because <laughs> Lois is a character, not a tool. And some writers forget this by overly relying on Lois as the person Superman always saves, and turning that mm-hmm. into the only person Superman ever saves. And this is exactly what happens in the DCEU movies where all Superman does is just save Lois from the various dumb things that happen to her. So it looks like he's only looking out for his date and just saving dumb Lois from dumber danger that she gets herself into. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is a disservice to Lois, who's actually a really well-written character in uh, in, in Man of Steel, I think. And we'll we'll get to that a little bit later. Yeah, but she acts like such an idiot for the entirety of BVS and Justice League that it's so frustrating, but she's actually She's clever. She's she's smart. I did think she was pretty good in the Snyder Cut, but yeah. that's because they didn't cut like 98% of her lines in that one. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so so uh, BVS and, and the, the Justice League are, are, are good examples of um, what happens when she is overused in the wrong ways. But uh, all this to say, uh, his, his true enemy, uh, again, you know, graduating from saving people to, to the real threat. No, no, no. His true enemy isn't villains, but the concept of collateral damage. Let's, you know, zooming back out and talking about Superman structurally again. Right. Um, it's it's not punching the bad guy enough to make the bad guy go away, but trying to stop the bad guy before innocent people get hurt. And, and we, we kind of explained this one already. But part of what makes it cool is that it's an asymmetrical conflict. If Superman's punching a guy and the guy's punching back, very simple, very one note. But if someone's punching Superman while lighting a trolley full of orphans on fire, (laughs) Superman has multiple things to worry about, and that becomes a much more interesting conflict. So it's even more impressive when Superman is put into these seemingly impossible situations and still wins. That's good writing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's also one of the only ways that Superman works on a team. Because otherwise it's like, what the, he makes everyone else redundant. And it's like, no, he doesn't. The mere fact that there's a lot of them means that it's like, okay, well, there's an example, uh, is an episode of Justice League. It's quite good. But part of that is like, all right, we're dealing with an exploding volcano and Doomsday just showed up. All right, <laughs> we'll handle the volcano. Superman, you you keep Doomsday busy. Yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah. do it. You, you handle the apocalyptic world ending threat. We'll handle the island ending threat. <laughs> anyway. Precisely. So um, looking at, you know, asymmetrical conflicts, a harrowing instance uh, <laughs> happens in the show Invincible, which I haven't watched all the way through. It's so gory. I, yeah, I I don't like yeah. it. I, I watched this scene and, and yeah. not fun. <laughs> no, no. Well crafted, but not fun. Yeah, well crafted, but not fun. Um, a scene in which uh, Omni Man, the the evil Superman character, and his son Mark, the Superman Superman character, aka Invincible, are mm. having a little fight. Uh, that Omni-Man directs into the main city and proceeds to cause all kinds of chaos that Mark attempts to solve. He tries to stop a building from falling over. He tries to save people in the middle mm-hmm. of fighting Omni-Man, but he can't because he's he's young. He's not ready. He hasn't had practice. He's very new at this and he's trying his hardest, but Omni-Man yeah. goes out of his way to kill the people who Mark just saved. And it's just an absolutely agonizing scene because Omni-Man is so viciously cruel towards humanity, demonstrating at every point just how little he thinks of them. And Mark is trying his absolute hardest to save them, but he can't. Excellent scene. Don't watch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is. I was watching this and I was like, I'm glad they're not doing this to like actual Superman because I feel like that would really change the tone of all future Superman stories in a way that couldn't be recovered from. I'm glad this is safe, like safe in its own little universe. Yeah. 
So um, yeah. a great example of, of using an evil Superman specifically alongside the foil of his son, the Superman Superman. But this can also mm -hmm. be where evil Superman falter if it's just, you know, just a character like Omni-Man in a vacuum. Because without the worry of collateral damage or a foil like Mark who does care about collateral damage, evil Superman's don't really have anything to use as stakes and they mm -hmm. essentially become blunt instruments to punch and be punched because their motivations are reduced to being evil and there's nothing that serves as a constraint anymore so you get back to the same exact problem of their power set of like okay what do i what do i do with this how do i make it interesting it becomes yeah. very difficult not impossible because you can do a lot of interesting stuff with internal character drama and that can be very cool but as a superman character this can get a little bit tricky if it feels like it's just edginess for, for edginess sake. Right. I guess from a mechanical standpoint, the way you could phrase it is that Superman's greatest weakness, and by weakness I mean exploitable character trait that you can use to make a story good by adding conflict, stakes, and drama, Superman's greatest weakness is that he cares. And yep. that means if you make a version of Superman who doesn't care, whether or not he's full-blown evil, if he doesn't care about people, Superman no longer has any narrative weaknesses you can use to make the story actually good. Okay, yep. let's get into it. <laughs> so, let's try this again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I knew it! I knew I was yep. tickling the dragon's tail yep. on no, that one! No, you you know, had you this know. look on your face! I... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we're gonna do this briefly. Season 1, Episode 4 of The Boys is a harrowing episode that I watched and really didn't like. I watched a lot of clips of the boys, I tried to immerse myself in this, and I tried to understand it, and I recognize Homelander is a very compellingly written character, and he's excellently acted. This is the one scene where I feel like it really comes together effectively. They are trying to save a plane, Homelander and the kind of Wonder Woman insert, uh, Queen Maeve. Uh, a flight is hijacked over the Atlantic Ocean, they fly to save it, they kill the terrorists on board, but Homelander is very careless in his use of heat vision and destroys the plane controls. So he says, oh, um, yeah, no, we're, we're done here. Sorry, we gotta leave. Maeve is like, can you, like, land it? Can you, like, try to put it down? He's like, nope, sorry, I, I can't. No, no, we're done here. She wants to save someone, and Homelander says, no, you, you can't save anyone, because if you save even one person and they tell the world how badly we messed up, we're screwed. So the collateral damage in this case isn't innocence, but it's their image. So what Homelander says is, we have to let this plane crash and pretends like we were too late to get to it. That's exactly what happened. It is a very compelling and harrowing scene because it shows the absolute cruelest inversion of Superman's drive to save people at all costs. Yeah. It is Homelander's own arrogance and laziness that leads him to overuse his heat vision and doom all these people on board. And it is the rare instance where I think the Superman analog, the America analog, and the celebrity analogs brutally converge Ooh. into this one moment where Homelander's main priority is not innocence, but his image and his reputation. And that's the one thing that, unlike him, is not indestructible. Humans are squishy, but he doesn't care. His reputation is something outside of him that he can't directly control. So he makes the brutal choice, let the plane crash, ham it up on screen afterwards. As much as I, you know, I tried to watch more of the boys, I'm like, nope, nope. <laughs> too gory. I'm having a bad time with this. Yeah, that's fair. This is an excellent scene for all the right, wrong reasons. I think that's interesting. I, I do think, uh sort of framing it as the, okay, what is this character's weakness? Uh, the fact that, okay, well, he doesn't care about innocent people, so it's not his compassion. Oh, but it's his image. Okay, this guy has no physical weaknesses, basically. He's got no compassion for anybody, so we can't use that. But if people don't think he's a real hero, he's got nothing. And I think that that is interesting. That's interesting writing. But what about, uh, and this, we kind of talked about how, like, Superman's indestructible, but... Maybe not. Maybe even without the dumb rock. <laughs> what about collateral damage to Superman by way of his psychology and his morality? Mm -hmm. The very clumsy version of this is when Superman sees Lois die and goes, like, insano tyrant mode, which is the, the plot of Injustice. Yes, and again, it's the issue of, oh, Lois is the only human being that Superman cares about and this yeah. proves it. And that's why I hate it whenever they do it. Really dumb. Yeah. But there is a lot of depth to the gray area between not good and evil, but paragon morality and cold calculating practicality. 
Ah. And this manifests in a few questions of how can protecting people maybe go too far? Is there a way to go too far in protecting people? What could possibly bend Superman's superhuman morality? And if that happens, what would such a morally conflicted Superman function like? What would they act like? What would, what would they become if some of these seemingly immutable characteristics of, of his, you know, his being aren't inverted, but just, just kind of tweaked a little bit? What, what happens there? It's not turning him into an, in, an evil, evil maniac, but it's just kind of, it's kind of playing with a few of the dials a little bit. What, what's that look like? And that leads to a handful of very interesting outcomes. Yeah, what does that look like? One is Superman ah. from the movie Gods and Monsters, specifically a series of shorts that they released, which are more interesting than the actual Gods and Monsters movie, unfortunately. Yeah, the movie's not bad. It just feels like it's setting up for a more interesting sequel that never came. Yeah. But, but the intro character shorts, the little five-minute clips, they're yeah. very interesting. Fascinating. So yeah. in this one, uh, all the characters are slightly different. Uh, Batman is a vampire. Uh, and Superman, I think, is the most interesting one here. He is yeah. the son of Zod. And he was raised by Mexican immigrant parents instead of, you know, landing in the middle of rural Kansas. He is still very much a hero. It's still in his bones to feed the hungry. That's that's what he says after he you know he he meets uh he's talking to to Batman and talking about yeah. the time that they first uh, interacted and Batman's like well, why did you save me and Superman says you were hungry. I think essentially framing it as this Superman is deeply compassionate and he was raised by a very underprivileged community for whom essentially sticking up for each other and fighting back against the people trying to hurt them. And like, you know, you give hospitality to people in need. If you have something, you share it with people who need it more than you. I think it's a very interesting way to frame the same core principles of, you yeah. know, use your power to help people, et cetera, et cetera. But rather than being like, use your position of extreme privilege to help people, it's like, you help because that's the only way anybody survives. Yeah. Everybody helps everybody else. So, you know, yeah. when Batman's like, I was eating a rat, why would you possibly help me? It's just <laughs> his only answer is you were hungry. And that's yeah. all he needs. It's probably his most unconditionally good act and statement in the movie. And and, and in this short, uh, we, we see him not unconditionally good, but dealing with a very difficult situation where yeah. there is a, a kid brainiac whose mind is essentially going haywire and threatening to blow up the earth. The army is going to send in a nuke on Metropolis and Superman says, give me five minutes, I'll handle this. And if I don't handle it in five minutes, you can still nuke the city. That's yeah, ex first exactly. first sign of his pragmatism, basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, as he's passing in to, to go confront Brainiac, uh, he passes a bus full of people who are like, save us, Superman. And he kind of like, mm, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. I am saving you. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, I'm saving you by taking care of the issue that is causing you trouble. Whereas, you know, Superman we know might, you know, get the bus out and then go back. But Superman here is like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to solve this issue. I'm going to do this right. Why would I, why would I waste my time here? I'm going to save you. You just might not feel saved until it actually happens. Uh, and, and when he gets in, he sees this, this small child crying, like, I can't stop it. I can't stop it. And Superman's like, okay, you know, focus, control your power. I had to learn how to do this. You can do it too. And mm -hmm. he sees it's not working and Brainiac's like, it's not working. I can't do it. I can't stop this. And Superman says, I can. And Brainiac looks at him and says, okay, do it. And Superman mm -hmm uses laser vision, zaps him, kills him, and stops the whole thing, and, you know, the, the big ball of energy, you know, collapses in on itself, and everyone's safe. Superman's sitting there just grieving over what he had to do, but still completely assured that this saved millions of lives. So yeah. it is, it is, it is cruel, it is cold, but it is still this Superman's idea of heroism. Maybe, maybe he could have talked Brainiac into figuring it out, but this Superman's like, I don't have the time. I can't. I tried it. It didn't yeah. work. I gotta do this instead. Yeah, his first move was compassion. He tried it a couple times, but basically when it came down to the wire, it's like, okay. And this Superman made a decision that our Superman probably couldn't do, or no. at least not without severe personal consequence, which is yeah, I'll kill this innocent child to save millions of lives. Essentially, it's it's a trolley problem that anyone suitably pragmatic would not be caught by, but what makes our Superman so compelling is that he would be caught by it. Yeah. He would just, he'd have to save everybody. <laughs> he'd have to, there, yeah. there'd be no other way for him. Exactly, and you can think of other ways yeah. that maybe, you know, Clark Superman would have would have addressed this, oh, I'll fly him into space or something. Yeah, but, I was gonna say, like, yeah. pick him up, fly him into space, deal <laughs> so, with it out there, problem yeah. solved. Metropolis isn't gonna be nuked, but you but, know. Yeah, it's, uh, it's it's really gut wrenching and a very effective introduction to this character uh, that it feels like oh they could have done so much more with it but you know oh well uh, another yeah. outcome of this is the Justice Lords from the Justice League cartoon excellent little mm -hmm. two part episode uh, it really stands out among the rest of the series where essentially what happens is 
Superman is confronting Lex Luthor, who is president, and has stopped some scheme, and Lex says, okay, what are you going to do? Throw me in jail, I'll be back out in two days, and then we'll start this whole thing again. Superman realizes that the only way to stop Lex from hurting people is to kill him. Yeah. And this kicks off a rapid deterioration (laughs) in the state of the world, where we hard cut to two years later, and the Justice League have become the Justice Lords, who are essentially turbo-fascists who lobotomize all of their villains and try to take out villainy and all chaos from the world by any means necessary, by exercising strict control, by going down to do things as little as as telling the president of the United States that they're not allowed to hold elections because that might cause chaos. And when some student protests happen, uh, Green Lantern and Hawkgirl show up and the students who are riding against the cops look up at the two members of the Justice League and are like, "Uh uh-oh, okay, now we're leaving. Bye, sorry, we're out of here. It's a harrowing episode because you see what could happen if the Justice League were to go down this road of just, like, complete and utter tyranny, where their ideals of protecting people remain, but their methods have become so corrupted and become extremely cruel. There's a really fascinating dynamic with the two Batmans that I don't want to touch on because it's a little tangential, (laughs) but it's a very good episode that is definitely worth um, looking at uh, to see what happens when when Superman makes the ultimate choice and then doubles down on it, and how our Superman ends up still able to to overcome them um, by actually making a deal with Lex and saying, you know, it was the hard choice, but, it, you know, saving people requires hard choices. I think that's really it. Like, this is essentially a Superman who made the easy choice. The easy choice to, okay, yeah, fine, we're just going to start solving these problems rather yeah. than putting Band-Aids over them. So he kills Luthor. And what they end up essentially protecting are not any actual innocent people, but the sort of conceptual nebulous idea of innocent people who would be doing better in a civilization where there is no petty crime or or conflict or whatever or something you know those are the people that the justice lords are theoretically protecting by crushing everything else into the pavement yeah and essentially it's like these are these are the justice lords that no longer care about individual people that can no longer see them as real people but instead see them as a concept a yeah. job to do and none of them seem happy none of them no. are like enjoying no, no, no. themselves yeah i think hawk girl says something to green lantern like remember when people liked us and it's like yeah. ha, ha, ha. <laughs> boy you guys really think that this was the only way to make it work huh okay yeah. cool all the time they say they'll thank us later that's the constant yep. through line is people saying, oh, they'll thank us later, but mm, yeah. One more outcome to talk about is Superman Red Sun, which I almost made this entire detail diatribe <laughs> about because it is so good. And I really, really like what they do here. Uh, I, I gave this one two slides, uh, but I still I still want to be mm. brief. Um, the premise here is what if Superman landed in Soviet Russia instead? This Superman, when we were first introduced to him, is a zealous paragon of Soviet ideology who is, you know, hoisted up onto a stage in this image that you see here by Stalin to be like, ah, yes, look, I'm Superman. Superman says, I am not a hero. I didn't build this dam. The Soviet people built this dam, and it's a monument of what we can accomplish when we work together. Still full communist Soviet ideology, but it's the absolute best idea of what that could mean. So he still Mm. is, you know, fiercely paragon about this, but his ideals have this slightly different lens that we are not used to. It ends up being really, really, really fascinating because we learn, or I guess Superman learns, that the gulags exist and Stalin's Ah. been doing all these horrible, awful purges. And what he does is he goes to Stalin and he's like, how dare you corrupt the ideals of our nation so thoroughly? And Stalin's like, oh, you wouldn't understand. I had to do this for the good of the people. And Superman's like, uh, yeah, you know, wise words. He kills Stalin. Yeah, lasers good of the him. people is very yeah. dangerous to yeah. say. <laughs> he becomes the Soviet premier and then essentially is the ruler of the USSR. And he becomes a full-on tyrant trying to optimize suffering out of society. Which is, mm. it's, that's, that's Soviet thinking. That's a very Soviet mind state. But what happens is he becomes very dictatorial. His his outfit changes, his manners change. He becomes a lot more cold and his idealism hardens to not quite lobotomizing people, but reprogramming them. You see all these people with like, you know, chips in the side of their head to be programmed to be perfect, you know, servants of the state where he's building these beautiful cities and he's accomplishing all these things. And he's like, look, hunger is down. We're doing all this stuff. And he's talking to Wonder Woman, who is kind of like a, you know, pro Soviet uh, ambassador from Themyscira. And is like, you're doing good, but be 
careful here. It's mm. interesting because it's not his powers that corrupt him, but his political authority over the state, where since he is directly in charge, he then starts to see everything as an optimization problem that can be solved, rather than reacting to things and protecting people as a hero. He's trying to, kind of like the Justice Lords, but from a very different angle, he's still trying to make it so that there's a world in which nothing bad ever happens to people, and he sees that as his heroism. There's a lot of other stuff that goes on with what the Americans are doing. They build an anti-Superman voiced by Travis Willingham, which is hilarious. Um, it's it, it's it's actually very interesting to see this very brutish portrayal of America that is very accurate to how, you know, Cold War Eastern Bloc powers would have seen America, where he's like, I stand for truth, justice, and the American way. And he sounds like such a bonehead mm. because of like the way he's talking about this. And it's like, this is all the same stuff that our Superman says, but it's filtered through this very like brash, arrogant thing. It's very interesting. Yeah. And the thematic climax of the movie at the very end, when he's going to invade America, kill President Luthor and take over the world. And all this time he's like, no, 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 no. I want to win the argument. I don't want to kill them. I don't want to, I don't want to destroy everything. I, I want, I want them to realize that I'm right. The Superman is still guided by his ideals, but they've just become so corrupt and twisted by his political power. And basically he himself becomes a Stalin-esque figure, which is really, really interesting. The crux is when he goes to the White House and First Lady, Lois Lane Luthor, Ooh. shows... <laughs> Superman, this miniaturized city of Stalingrad, which was earlier it had been miniaturized, and Superman was like, how do you have this? I tried so hard to to reverse it, to fix it and put it back. And then the realization is, well, he actually could have at any time, but he didn't. And the thematic mm -hmm. message is that Superman wanted the entire world to be this perfect little city in a bottle, just like Stalingrad. Right. And he realizes, oh my God, the error of my ways. And then it becomes a whole thing. Brainiac says, yeah, you know, I, I could have brought Stalingrad back at any point, but you you didn't ask if you wanted to. I could have, you didn't ask. Uh, Superman realizes, oh wait, you know, I've, I've made a mistake. This is terrible. He's like, okay, Brainiac, let's, let's go home. We're done here. And Brainiac is like, suboptimal, and he zaps the city of Stalingrad and destroys it, and basically reveals, like, I have been using you this whole time for me to gain power, which seems like it cheapens Superman's thing by, like, oh, it was just, it was Brainiac who was manipulating him the whole time. I don't think it does, even though it kind of seems that way for a second, because Superman still was in charge, and he was letting Brainiac run the optimization problems, but it was still Superman calling the shots. Maybe he had more numerical incentive to, like, oh, I can see the statistical models telling me that it'll be better if I do this, right. it was still a lot of Superman's own choices, and he refused to do a lot of what Brainiac told him to. A lot of the back third of the movie is Brainiac saying, do this, and Superman's like, no. Um, <laughs> so what he does is he essentially makes the big sacrifice to, you know, Brainiac's gonna blow everything up, um, and Superman, you know, throws him out into space and seemingly dies. Uh, Lex Luthor resigns from the presidency, and then Lois Lane looks into the audience and sees American reporter Clark Kent hey in the audience taking notes on the speech, and then you kind of get the, the, the whole twist of like, okay, Soviet Superman is dead, Clark Kent lives. Very, very cool. So you see Superman yeah. make the big heroic sacrifice in the end. He ends up making the choice that, that our Superman would have made. Yeah. Uh, and I really like this a lot and would definitely recommend it. Um, it's a great example of a Superman who still is the good guy in the end, but who who had his morality just steadily eroded away by all of these hard choices by decades in leadership. The movie ends in the late eighties. Um, mm. it, it goes for a while. Like he's he's in wow. power for like thirty years. Yeah, it's 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 genuinely very cool. The thing with Brainiac, it, it's interesting because of course thematically putting the whole world in a bottle, that's very, you know, Brainiac is the one who shrank Kandor and made it the bottle city of Kandor. So it seems like Superman is like, no, that's a good idea. We can protect it if it's, if it's, you know, if it's essentially in a bottle and we're <laughs> controlling everything around it. We can keep it safe until we can make things better. Like, that's genuinely something that our Superman does sometimes do. He has the bottle city of Kandor just in the Fortress of Solitude and he's like, when I can figure out how to make it the regular size again, I will. Until then, we'll keep it safe and everything will be fine. And it's interesting that this is just a half step away from that, but it's a very important half step. It's yeah. an entire nation. And it's like, okay, Kandor was shrunk and we don't know how to fix that. So it, we'll make the best of it. But this is like, but it's better that way because then I can keep them all safe so easily. And it's like, uh-uh, no, you don't want to do that. And I do think it's interesting that like this is essentially 
the hard choices of being in politics, making this Superman like a worse person, sort of yeah. like yeah. pushing him in these directions. That, and of course, that's a that's a very commonly understood thing just in real politics. A lot of very hard choices, making decisions yeah. for large numbers of people. It's very easy to lose sight of the humanity of those individual people. Again, like we said with the Justice Lords. But I do think one thing that makes it easier for Elseworld versions of Superman to sort of fall for that is that it's not hard for Superman to see people as others and as a community that he's sort of apart from. It's not difficult for him to see people as not people. And part of what makes our Superman so interesting is that despite the possibility that he could do that, he never ever does. He always yep. sees everybody as a real person. That's, you know, the main reason why he kind of has his no kill thing is like, they're all people. I have to give them chances, you know? I have to do the right thing. Whether or not it has the better effect in the long run, I cannot start being the kind of person who does bad things for good reasons, because then you'll do bad things for bad reasons. So our Superman's ironclad principles are essentially maintained only by his internal knowledge that he could easily turn into this. Yeah. It would be so easy, and that's the thing. These are all Superman who took the easy way of yeah, you know what? I could have complex political negotiations with people. I could win this argument. Or I could just do it anyway with yeah. overwhelming force. And that option, I think, every time you get a Superman who goes political, his constant awareness of the option of just overwhelming force, not even, oh, it'd start a war. Like, no, I'd just win. I could just make you do it. I think that's a very important factor. That's actually what happens is Superman restarts the Korean War, but wins it and takes South Korea in three hours. Hmm. Uh, because it's like, I, you know, the first time this happened, three million people died. This time, like, 6,000 people died. Still bad, but... Eh. Oh my god, this Superman just has the a million is a statistic mindset. He's just weighing statistics. It's yeah. not about people. It's about numbers. Of course they made him Stalinist Russia. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. This movie is really winning me over. The, the, this movie is, is great because as soon as Superman makes the choice to kill Stalin, he's already become him. Yeah. Because he even says, like, when, when he and Stalin are talking, Superman's like, yeah, you're right. And then he zaps him. So the last mm -hmm. thing he does before he kills Stalin is agree with him. Even though Stalin was basically laying the justification for his own death, that same mentality and that same morality of, if I can make this problem go away by making you go away? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll do it. And at several other points, Superman refuses to make the easy choice. He refuses for 20 years to go invade the United States, even though he could. He could yeah, and he win, could. but he doesn't because he says, I want to win the argument. He still thinks he's making the hard choice and maybe half of it he is, but he's already made the easiest choice of all, which is just, I'm going to, I'm going to organize myself and it's going to be great. I really think there's a lot to like in this movie, even though it is, you know, on paper, it's an evil Superman movie. It's so much more complex than that because you see him go down and you see him come back up. That's good. I like that. And then very quickly, we, <laughs> we could spend a lot of time on this. I kind of don't want to. Um, Man of dunks. Steel is the dumb version of this where they somehow took a movie where Clark demonstrates an overwhelming drive to do heroism and makes the entire movie revolve around the question of whether Clark Kent should be Superman at all. I wonder why a person who has gone on record saying he doesn't like or understand <laughs> Superman would make a movie about whether or not Superman should even exist. I wonder why that would be on his mind. Yeah. Anyway. <sighs> um, it's, it's frustrating. Uh, more so because it's it's not just dumb. There is a lot of really good Superman stuff here sprinkled at various points throughout the film, but everyone contradicts each other and everybody is brooding kind of accept Clark, but then it starts to infect him and he gets all broody and weird as well, which <laughs> then seeps into the later movies. Oh, yeah. But there's just so many weird mixed messages, metaphors that don't make sense. There's things juxtaposed that seem like they're supposed to be two sides of a conversation, but actually don't revolve around each other in any way. There's a whole thing about like, oh, you should fight back uh, with, with Clark as a kid and like, oh, you know, I can't fight back because I've got all these powers. And then Clark is like, oh, but I need to be Jesus analog and sacrifice myself for humanity. And it's just, it's very weird um, hmm. because it all kind of dances around this question that didn't even need to be asked. Where it's like, you know, other other Superman stories that we kind of saw in this vein of like what happens in Superman's dealing with complex morality. Those questions don't 
belong in this movie because you already had a Superman who wanted to be a hero and and Pa Kent is like you should be a hero but not now because humanity will be weird about it and then of course you get the very famous scene of him in the tornadoes yeah. like bah, 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 don't save me don't do it don't save me yeah that's really the the most damning scene in the whole movie and it clearly has an impact on Clark because even though he's you know talking big game about sacrificing himself for for humanity and giving himself up to Zod the latter part of the movie doesn't concern itself with collateral damage, and as a result, neither does Clark. And this really comes to a head in the climactic battle, where Superman takes the fight with Zod out of Metropolis, and then they go back to Metropolis <laughs> before yeah, he kills him. This. It's uh, yeah. so stupid because the movie's desire for set piece explosions overrides any sense of, of Clark's agency and choice to avoid collateral damage. There are two scenes like this. There's one in Smallville, one in Metropolis, where everybody seems to be wanting to make a mess except Clark, but Clark doesn't stop anyone from making a mess, and it's just they uh. have this fight, and sure, they explore you know, the consequences of that in Batman v Superman, but it's just so disappointing. It's got good things, it's got bad things, but it trips over itself to override any positive thing it could have said about Superman, which makes it more frustrating than if it was just bad. Like, Batman v Superman is just bad and that doesn't bother me, <laughs> but Man of Steel is so close to actually being good in a few important spots and just ruins it which sucks. <laughs> That's really interesting. I Man of Steel is the one that I haven't been able to work up the nerve to watch. I've watched Bam v Superman, I watched both versions of Justice League, uh, and I wasn't soups impressed with their portrayal of soups, but from what I've heard of Man of Steel, it's only ever seemed frustrating. And I have seen some bits from the final fight where they're just absolutely tearing up Metropolis. Like it looks like the aftermath of the worst like carpet bombing you've ever seen. Yeah. And it's like, our hero, everybody. Yeah. He doesn't even seem to notice. And that's, I mean, you know, everyone kind of riffed on the fact that in the final fight of Batman v Superman, everyone keeps being like, oh, it's a good thing it's a Sunday and the city's empty. <laughs> or, oh, yeah, we'll fight him on the docks where there's never anybody ever, especially after dark. And it's like, good job, team. You've managed to sort of remember that you're supposed to be saving innocence without at any point having to actually show our heroes saving innocence. Yeah, the problem is not just like, oh, yes, we, we, we can solve this by having no one get hurt. It's not just no one gets hurt, which Man of Steel also fails at. It's yeah. saving people from danger. It's so rare in this movie that we get to see Superman save anyone who's not Lois, and the one other time that we do when little kiddo Clark saves a bus full of his fellow school kids, Pa Kent tells him off about it afterwards. Like, how dare you save those kids? Your secret could have been compromised. And clearly Clark has his priorities straight, but the rest of this movie just wears him down so much that he eventually in the you know, later DCEU stuff just becomes so much of a sourpuss that he feels like no one wants him to be Superman because this movie spends its whole runtime telling him that no one wants him to be Superman. That's why I hate it so much, but- I had a question, actually. Yeah. The, the vibe I always got from the Snyder movies is that it's like the movies aren't even aware of the fact that they're supposed to be saving innocent people. It's like yeah. innocent people will be in danger and get hurt, and the main characters won't even seem to notice or respond. And again, by the time they get to the Snyder Cut of Justice League, they've actually sort of fixed that. They save all the scientists. It's great. From what I've seen of Man of Steel, it feels like up until the bit where they're like, oh, no, Superman, you absolutely must break Zod's neck with your bare hands. We're giving you no other options. Have fun, <laughs> baby. Like, it seems like up until that point, it doesn't even occur to him that punching Zod into a skyscraper would probably kill a f load of people. Yeah, and he doesn't seem to express. Not right, so the vibe I got is that it's like it doesn't even, like he never even seems to notice. But of course, there's so much focus put on, oh, everyone's in the wreckage afterwards, everyone's in shock. And it's like, yeah, and we're supposed to think that our hero is cool because he doesn't even seem to notice. I, th I think that read is accurate. They they have the Smallville fight, which gives him a chance to realize, oh, wow, a lot of people got hurt in that. But then they mm. just do the same exact thing in Metropolis. So if the wow. Metropolis fight was the first fight, maybe we could read it charitably, but it's not, so we can't. But I want to talk about uh, two, two things, thing. uh, a couple things I didn't like. Uh, a show I do like, Superman and Lois, is really, really... Really, 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 really good because <laughs> it uh, it has an interesting premise that we haven't really seen before, which is Superman and Lois who are married with twin sons, uh, teenagers, uh, teenage boys Ooh. in Smallville. And that's a cool premise. But the reason that it's so compelling is because it focuses unflinchingly on Superman's humanity and the kinds of difficult situations that can sometimes get him into where he could take the easy route and he never, ever does. 
which is great. Mm-hmm. You see in a flashback sequence um, to him kind of becoming Superman and, and showing the first parts of his life with Lois before the pilot of the show, uh, the very first thing that we see him do is save a car that's you know driving off a highway. And this shot right here is a direct homage to Action Comics number one, where Superman is yep. saving a green PT Cruiser looking car. And it's super <laughs> cool to see that kind of reflected in this way, that this is the root of the character. The first thing we see him do on the cover of the comic book before anything else is he saves people. That's compelling. So it's it's cool because you see him challenged laterally with problems that he can't punch. And even in this first episode as well, with problems that he can't just save people from. He's working with Lois at the Daily Planet, and she's like, you know, the Superman guy is getting on my nerves because all of the coverage of him doing all these rescue ops is getting in the way of the fact that there are some systemic problems that you can't save with a rescue. Ooh. There's this entire plot line of Superman and Lois doing investigative reporting to figure out who's behind a string of like Nazi crimes against minorities and minority owned businesses in, in Lower Metropolis, and they use their skills as investigators to figure this out, and then they can, you know, then they can fight the bad guy. But it's it's not just punching, they have to be smart, they have to be clever, and they're doing it to save people rather than just fight some some giant, you know, weird big bad. It shows mm-hmm. them being a team and it shows the interesting kinds of storylines you can get when you're not just working on the punchy punch stuff. So there are several points in the show where he he makes very painful sacrifices to himself for the sake of saving people. He basically gets completely depowered um, partway through season one to save an entire town of people who've been corrupted by the bad guy. Mm. And he he unflinchingly makes this choice, even though a lot of bad stuff happens to him afterwards. Uh, and, and later on in the second season, when he saves someone uh, at great cost to himself, and that person says, you shouldn't have saved me, Superman says, saving a life is never a mistake. And that's like, uh, boom. There it is. That's the crux of the character, that no matter what happens, Superman is like, I saved you. Even if that gets me killed, I saved mm-hmm. you, and that's what matters. Because the first time that, you know, I don't, that I make the choice not to save someone, it's not even the first time I make the choice to kill someone. The first time I make the choice not to save someone because it might inconvenience me, yep. I've lost. I'm toast. Yeah. He's, he can't Batman Begins anyone. Yeah. It's not allowed. It's good. I, I like it a lot. I, I, I want to watch the rest of the show. I've only seen a couple episodes because I, I already spent a lot of time watching a lot of <laughs> Superman media for this. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm a slow watcher. But I, I like that a lot. And, and, and we could very well probably do a third detail diatribe on this with things that we missed in this one but to to, to briefly recap um, Superman uh, I think and I think Red maybe you think as well uh, is at Mm -hmm. his best when he's challenged by the threat of collateral damage not just having villains and and stuff to punch because his power set is boring in a fist fight but it's perfectly suited to rescues and drama and saving innocence and his morality is boring when it's inverted for edge factor, but it's fascinating to explore the boundaries. How yep. does Superman operate? What does he value? What does he prioritize in sticky situations? What choices will he make in maybe seemingly impossible circumstances, even though they maybe seem a little contrived? And how will we see our hero always sacrifice his own well-being for the sake of the people that he loves and cares about, whether that's his family or innocent strangers, and how he still values people as people, even if he doesn't know them. Mm. All that to say, uh, just let Superman be a hero. I I promise it's more interesting. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, no, I I think there's a lot of really good examples of Superman in interesting contexts having to be clever or tactical to save people. One of the uh, examples that I recommended to you was uh, an episode of Justice League called, I believe, Doomsday Sanction, which, as mentioned before, Volcano, island exploding. The Justice League are already there to evacuate the island. And then Doomsday shows up to fight Superman. <laughs> and there's just a great bit where, like, he's on the comms with Wonder Woman. And he's getting punched at the time so she can, like, hear that something bad's going down. And he's like, oh, just a little distraction. Don't worry about it. Keep evacuating the island. I'll handle <laughs> things here. And it's like, yeah, you will. Yeah, yeah you will. Uh, and again, it, it, it's it's a case where, like, it's just a normal boring punch up with Doomsday. That could be so boring. But the fact that the backdrop is... He kind of has to keep a handle on this because everyone else has their hands full and this is his job. This is one of the only contexts where, and again, it makes sense for Superman to be on a team because this gives him mm-hmm. a job on that team. Everyone yep. else has their own strengths and weaknesses and limitations. Superman is the one who saves everybody. And this isn't a Superman example, but this is something I really like about how Earth's Mightiest Heroes handles Thor. There are a lot of situations where, like, everyone else is like, all right, we're going to do our thing, we're going to do our thing, and Thor, you hold up the entire island of Manhattan that is currently falling out of the sky. And he's like, verily, exactly. and goes off and does that. And just having the role of the character who's like, 
yeah, okay, I can save everybody else while you guys have your own interesting, con- like, personal interconflict, whatever. Have have fun with that. I will go and rescue all the people. Yeah. Uh, that's a that's a side of teamwork that can be really fun. And I think this is sort of the invisible core of his character. And I think, as mentioned, the fact that a lot of people sort of lose sight of that in favor of, oh, he's so strong and cool. Look at his cool powers. Look at his scary glowy eyes. Beware the Superman. Maybe he's like a Jesus figure now. That'll be fun. <laughs> then you end up with these stories where it's like, okay, but what's the point? What's the yeah. point of this character? And they're like, exactly. yes, what is the point? Let's contemplate the point of Superman. And it's like, no, <laughs> no, this means you just didn't do your homework. We know <laughs> what the point of Superman is. You know how much stuff goes wrong on a daily basis? Yeah. Uh, and that's why it's interesting when we have the stories that let Superman solve problems. But it's also interesting, as you mentioned with, with Superman and Lois, that you can have the things where it's like, hey, you can't actually just punch this. You can't even just overpower it. Like, overwhelming force will not actually solve this for you. You got other stuff to do. Like, you got to do some detective work first and then you can punch. And that's, again, it's it's a way to sort of be like, hey, this guy is not actually omnipotent. You know, this this isn't God, man. He can't just do anything. He has a limited skill set. It's a very extensive limited skill set, but there are things he can't just do and things that take him work and things that can go wrong and hurt him in ways that are actually interesting to explore in a story. It's not just, you know, set him against another action figure and let him bash each other around <laughs> a little while. Yeah. And, you know, part of why... Uh, <sighs> Part of why I think I haven't really been getting a lot out of a lot of recent superhero media is just this general loss of focus on what exactly the point of superheroes is. Because people can focus on the spectacle, but the spectacle only works when it has strong foundations. And if you build something that's only spectacle without ever doing the foundations, you get something that's, you know, it's all frosting and no cake. No, I I think that's exactly right. Focus on the core of the character and the rest of the stories fit when yeah. the core is wrapped around this 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 heart superman's compassionate heart and the focus of everything he does is on people and it just uh, it works it just works I, yeah it does <laughs> i think the fact that when it's innocent people the narrative does not guarantee they're all going to get out okay the story doesn't give them the same safety net that main named characters get yeah and that's important that stakes <laughs> otherwise superhero stories don't have stakes especially exactly. not superman who's pretty much impossible to stop ex- unless you have his off switch and then he's really boringly easy to stop pocket sand so, yeah pocket sand <laughs> yeah but um until we do this a third time uh, uh bye, bye. <laughs> <laughs> Woo!